Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm Aaron Smith, uh, part of the Computer Architecture Group here at MSR, and today uh, we're going to have Simone Campononi talking about uh, dynamic optimization of .NET code. Um, and so he is currently a postdoc at uh, Harvard working with David Brooks, and uh, you recently graduated, what, uh, one year ago? Yeah. Yeah. And before that he was in uh, Milan where he was working on ILD JITs, part of his master's and PhD thesis. Good. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, basically, ILDJIT is a, a compilation framework for CIL by code. And uh, <coughs> this lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about this framework. So we target CLI because uh, the standard has a nice future that we can have a cooperation across different source languages. So we can translate different source language to the CIL, and then the virtual machine can run this code. And this, is, uh, this is thanks to the fact that the CIL byte code is more complex than, for example, compared with the Java byte, Java byte code. <coughs> and therefore, the virtual machine also is more complex. So, oh, I'm going to start talking about the, the standard, the CLI standard, just to have a common background. I'm sure that you know better than me the standard. But the, so basically, the CLI is composed by uh, metadata, which is, uh, <coughs> uh, is composed by five streams. And, uh, and then we have a bytecode language, CIL, which is tech-based language. So for example, if you want to, uh, for example, add the, the first two uh, parameters and store the result to uh, the first local variable, we need to push the first two argument. And oh, I don't know why it's working. Oh, can you use this one? Yeah. We have to push the first two argument and then perform the operation and then store the result at the, at the first local variable. As we can see here is that <coughs> the same task, we can perform the same task by, re, uh, by using a register-based language in just by one operation. And the difference here is that if we, if we, are ta if we, uh, if we want to write optimization, which is a big task of any compiler, <coughs> it's, much, it's easier to write optimization algorithm on these kind of languages, rather than <coughs> stack-based languages. Stack-based are really good languages to, to have a compact version of the method, basically. <coughs> That's why in Ildigit we introduce a new language called Intermediate Representation, IR, which is register-based. And we translate CIL to this language, and every other model of the compiler works <coughs> at this level. The same amount of information that we have at, in, at the CIL level, we have also at the IR level. <coughs> also, the standard introduced an, an engine, which is called Virtual Execution System, which basically is the, the piece of software that is in charge to uh, run the CIL bytecode. And finally, we have a, a, what is called Base Class Library, which is a set of classes <coughs> that the any CIL program can rely on. This is a set of classes, which means also it's a set of methods. And a subset of these methods are called native methods. And they have the feature to have the signature in CIL, but the body has to be provided by the virtual machine. <coughs> which means that every dynamic compiler has to implement any of these native methods. I want to just uh, spend one word on this, on this task. Uh, with, uh, the usually native methods are used to uh, to work 
to interact with the underlying operating system. So usually they, they, are, they are the wrapper of system calls, basically. But also we, uh, they are used, I, I've seen that they are, they, they are used also for performance reasons. And I'm thinking on if it is really true, because uh, <coughs> with my experience, inside the dynamic compiler, every time the execution goes from the CIL world to the uh, native, to the uh, internal of the compiler, then we have a boundary that uh, it brings problems to optimize uh, the code in an interprocedural way. And also, current, currently in Illigit, 30% of the code is only to implement these kind of methods, which is, if you think about it, it's really a huge portion of the compiler. <coughs> okay. The state of the art of virtual machine includes just-in-time compiler, uh, as every one of you knows. And basically, the idea is to compile the bytecode just before executing it. So we'd, we're going to compile the code on we, only when we are sure that we, we need it. <coughs> so the approach is we consider the uh, application code as a set of translation units that usually are methods of or region. And we start compiling and executing the first translation unit is the entry point, is the main function. <coughs> and then every time the execution goes outside the compiler translation unit, we, the execution has been redirected back to the just-in-time compiler in order to compile and execute the requested method. So here we can see that uh, in the first phase of the execution, we have a set of execution stalls so basically, the compiler spends half of the time to compile and optimize the code, and then it executes it execute them. <coughs> okay. So currently, uh, the static compilation outperforms dynamic compilation due for two, for two reasons, basically. The first one is the startup time, which is the set of execution stores that we have seen previous, in the previous slide. The second one is that since the time span to optimize the code is an additive term of the total execution time, usually just-in-time compilers generate not optimal code compared to the static compiler. So basically, uh, the, the static compiler, also called ahead of time compilation, spend more time to translate and optimize the code in order to spend less time at runtime to run the, the code, generated code. <coughs> okay. So now I'm, I'm going to start to introduce the Ildigit. So basically, Ildigit is a CII compiler designed from scratch for parallel systems, for multi-core systems, basically where the, the communication has been performed through shared memory. The main design choices of this, comp this compiler is that the translation unit is method, the, and we introduce the, uh, an intermediate representation IR so the translation process is we translate the CIL to IR, then every module works at this level, at the IR level, and then finally we generate the machine code and we run it. <coughs> the entire compiler has been organized in shared libraries and external plugins, which is basically a plugin is an is a, a external library that can be detected and loaded at runtime by the compiler. So at, at, um, when the ill-digit ill uh, bootstrap, it checks the underlying file system and it loads every plugin that it can find. <coughs> and then it exploit them to compile the code and optimize the code. So I'm going to present the IR language, which is the part of the compiler. So basically, it's a, it's a really simple language. And <coughs> so it's composed by uh, 56 instructions, instruction types. Uh, okay, yeah. And then we have uh, arithmetic operation, risk-like, like add operation, sub, sub division, etc. Then we have branches instruction, conditional and non-conditional. Then we have also instruction to handle explicitly exception. And we have memory instruction 
like new, which is a common instruction for object-oriented model <coughs> to allocate a new object at runtime. We have only one try-catch block per method, which this is different from the CIL, where uh, we don't have this constraint. And we, uh, we have that every variable at this level has the bytecode data type. So basically, basically, we have abstracted from the CIL byte data type <coughs> in order to uh, be able to also, if you want to change the uh, input language. And here we have the information about the uh, already computer layout information of classes, and we have the uh, relation across the classes. So we can, we can know if one class is a subtype of another one, and we can introspect to the classes to, to look at the field or the inter interface implemented, etc. <coughs> then here we have an unlimited li number of registers. So which means that register allocation is going to be performed later. And the language is platform independent. <coughs> this future, the memory instructions, data type, uh, instruction type, and this, yeah, and the fact that the variable has the bytecode data type is really useful to, to implement, to be able to implement um, aggressive code optimization that exploit uh, high level data type <coughs> like memory alias analysis analyzer okay so an example of the of the IR method is here we add to register and we store the result to, to a new one <coughs> and here the more complicated example here we have a, a the first part is a normal method, a normal instruction types, and then at the end we have um, uh, the single catch block, and we always put at the bottom of the method because we uh, illegitimate compile and optimize the code at runtime. So uh, the current policy is that we optimize only the first part of the code, and when the code optimization see that there is a start catcher instruction that mark the start of the bottom part of the method is stop to optimize the code. This is because basically this part is, is, has been executed only when the, an exception is, has been thrown, which is a, an exceptional case. <coughs> so I'm going to introduce the structure of the compiler, which is useful if you want to use or extend it. So we have the uh, CLI manager <coughs> here that is in charge to translate the, the bytecode to intermediate representation, the code optimizer, the virtual machine of the IR language, the garbage collection, the orchestrator of the wall compiler, which is called Pipeliner, which is in charge to uh, compile everything in parallel in order to decrease the delay of the compilation. And then we have a profiler that is in charge to profile only internal models of the compiler, because the profiling the, the generated code is, is, is done by the code optimizer, as we will see later. Then we have the ahead of time compiler. Also. So the CLI man, manager, as we said, we, is in charge to translate the code, the bytecode, load and decode the PECOF file, as well as the CIR sections, manage the metadata, and compute the layout information of classes and structures. And also, this model is in charge to effectively implement the native methods. As we said before, this, this is the 30% of, of the compiler, which is huge. <coughs> the optimizer is in charge to for optimize the code, profile, if we want to profile the generated code, decide the optimization settings to apply for each method, and schedule the previous task. So basically, we, uh, the optimization and the uh, execution profiling has been perform performed by external plugins. This is to, due to the fact that this, is, uh, this part of the compiler is, uh, 
is the, is uh, it should be is extensible. We can have a collaboration across different plugins, and we have that each plugin declare, declares its dependencies, and then the optimizer has to compute the as to ensure that every dependency has been uh, respected. <clears throat> so basically, the, when the optimizer start, you look at the underlying uh, file system, it loads every plugin that it, it is able to, to find. It compute this plugin uh, dependency graph. <clears throat> and then every time someone try to run, for example, a dead code elimination plugin, then the optimizer called before the, the, the its dependencies, which is the liveness variable. <coughs> OK. Then we have the virtual machine of the intermediate representation. And here we have that uh, this module is in charge to translate the, the method from IR to the machine code. Currently, we rely on the code generator library, which is called libgit is um, a part of the .gnu project. Since we, when we start the, the Ildigit project, Libgit wasn't, mm, uh, wasn't finished as well as now. It's not finished. So we have made a strong collaboration with the team <coughs> in order to extend and fix problems of that library. Then we have a garbage collection, which is a important task. Here, what, we've, what we have found <coughs> by an experiment, experimental evaluation, evaluation is that it is important to have two different interfaces for two different tasks. The first one is collect memory used by the CIL application, and the second one is collect memory for the user by the compiler itself. Because the uh, user pattern is, are different, because the ill-digit is being written in C language. And the CIL follows the object-oriented model, so which means that includes finalizers, as well as we have much more information compared to the C language. So basically, we can distinguish between pointers and integers. On the other hand, the compiler is being written in C, which means that everything can be used as pointers. So the uh, reachability, memory, memory reachability analysis is much more complicated in this case. <coughs> then we have the pipeliner, which, which basically orchestrates everything on the, inside the compiler. And the model is, is a pipeline. And each stage uh, has been performed and rely on external, external plugins. So the optimizer, CLI manager, and the other virtual machine. Here, the pipeline, we, gonna, we use the pipeline whenever the execution goes to a not yet compiled CIL method. We, the purpose of this model is to overlap the compilation phases. And here, we have made a design choice that we ensure global memory initialization before its first usage when we compile the method. So basically, here the, in the CLI standard, uh, there are what is called static fields. So it's basically, it's a global memory. And the, virtual, the, the, the dynamic compiler has to ensure that that memory has been initialized before its first usage. Instead of using trampolines to do that, we basically, every time we compile a method and we find that a method can, can read some values from this, this kind of memory, then we run the initialization method of that piece of memory. This is because the execution time spent at this stage is really negligible. So there is no good reason to introduce some trampolines here, because the, the generated code cannot be optimized, as in this case. OK. The current implementation includes some uh, first in, first out pipe that synchronize the different uh, pipeline stage. The number of threads here depends on the workload, which means that depends on the number of methods that are in the input pipe. <coughs> and we, have, we rely on the hysteresis 
model here. So every time the number, the input pipe includes more methods, we split new threads. And when the workload decreases, so we, we have already performed the compilation, we decrease also the number of threads of that stage. And we don't rely on a linear model of, for the obvious reason to not continue to split and kill threads at some time. <coughs> and the pipeline has an interface that we can rely on and we can uh, compile the, the method synchronously or asynchronously. asynchronously. <coughs> so the profiler is uh, profile the time spent by the internal compiler modules. Um, we, we can have different levels of accuracy of this profiling. And this is this target, uh, this is useful if you want to extend ill digit. So you, if you want to know uh, how much time your module is going to spend at one time. <coughs> so for example, if you want to evaluate the LLVM backend in ill digit, we take the IR virtual machine, we delete this part, we implement the translator of LLVM, and then we use profiler to, to see if uh, LLVM backend is, works better than libgit. Finally, we have the out of time compiler. <coughs> Here, we have chosen to perform the at out of time the first two phases. So we translate the CIL to intermediate representation and we optimize the code at static time. <coughs> and then at runtime, we translate the machine, the IR to machine code and we initialize the memory. <coughs> this is because the IR is a platform independent, so we we don't lose uh, yeah, platform independencies. And the question is how much we save in this case. <coughs> the translation from IR to the machine code is less than 0.01% of the total execution time, which is totally negligible. <coughs> the memory initialization stage, <coughs> it, it, uh, it, is, it takes less than 0.7% of the total execution times on, on uh, for example, on spec benchmarks. <coughs> so which means that the time that we spend on the completion process is more than 99%. So currently, we, uh, this is also because we don't have uh, many code optimization algorithms that are platform dependent, <coughs> like register allocation, instruction selection. Right? So, but the common code optimization algorithm like copy propagation, constant propagation, loop and rolling, whatever, is platform independent code optimization and they are performant at static time. <coughs> okay, so the status of the project is that currently we are able to run CIL that came from C and C sharp. The, uh, we, have, we have implemented every method, native method that came from the base class library of .gnu project. We have half of this method that came from Mono. <coughs> we are able to generate code for Intel, for ARM, and for the new instruction set also of Intel. <coughs> we have 25 code optimization algorithms that include code analysis like memory alias analysis, and 15 code optimizations that includes method inlining, loop and rolling, loop and switching, and the normal code optimization algorithm that you can find in the famous compiler books. <coughs> we have four different garbage collectors. Three are basic different implementation of the mark and sweep algorithm. And we have a copy, oh, copy garbage collector also. Oh, uh, also, I want to say that in Illigit, everything has been, okay, you, you can customize everything. So if you want to disable the garbage collection, you can do it. So if you know that uh, your CIL application doesn't rely on objects, for example, but rely on, on, but use only value types, what is called value types on the standard, which is the structure that are allocated in the stack, then you can disable the garbage collection if you want. <coughs> if we evaluate the performance, uh, here I, I have to say that Illigit works only on Linux, so we cannot compare to .NET. 
So we compared with mono and portable.net, which is the uh, dynamic compiler of the .gnu project. And here we compare Ildigit with in the worst scenario, that is single core. Basically, we, uh, our system is a multi-thread system, so we have an additional overhead compared to mono, for example. So if we run, if we compare <coughs> our compiler with mono, we are working on the worst case. Even in this case, we are competitive with mono and portal.net. This is the execution time, uh, normalized with the execution time of portal.net, so lower is better. The black bar is ill-digit, and the green, gray one is, <coughs> is mono. And here is one. I, here is the execution time of portal.net in this line. <coughs> if, you, if you look at the, the, the benchmark, S, it means small input a small input of the program, L is long input of the program. Every time we run small, uh, uh, the benchmark with the small input, the execution time is going to be uh, less than one second. And we have a, a bootstrap process that takes more time compared to with mono, because it's a single thread mono. So we have to split threads at, uh, at bootstrap time so every time we run CIL program that takes only less than, few sec than, less than one second, then we uh, mono outperform in digit. Otherwise, we are totally competitive. <coughs> OK. Also in ARM, uh, currently we, we works better than mono <coughs> in the ARM processor. OK. <coughs> so a summary, the characteristics of the project is that it's a multi thread system. Everything has been performed in parallel, and it is or, uh, organized by the Pipeliner <coughs> module. It is optimized for multi-core systems. It is easy extensible due to the fact that basically everything, quite most everything, has been implemented through plugins. And it's a free software you can download from SourceForge. <coughs> Some statistics. Uh, we have implemented more than 300,000 lines of code. It includes out of time compiler, just in time compiler, and two different implementations of what we call dynamic lookout compilers that I'm going to present soon. And the number of downloads in less than three years is 15,000. And the website access are, came from 50 different states. <coughs> OK. OK, the users of, of the project is Politecnico di Milano, is the university where I got the PhD, into two different European research projects. It, really, uh, it is really easy extensible. In, in fact, we, uh, we use, currently we use eDigit inside the teaching class in order to get homework, basically. <coughs> also, Fraunhofer Institute of Berlin run eDigit to run software uh, for digital television. As far as I know, the software is uh, basically is an implementation of what is called scalable video decoder. <coughs> also, we use Ildigit in Harvard University. And currently, Ildigit is run on top of the platform NHK15, that is an ARM-based embedded system. <coughs> and also, in Irvia, the uh, French uh, Research Institute of, uh, is, uh, use Ildigit. So basically, I try to, to evaluate it digit for dif in different contexts. So <coughs> there is a research proje project at Harvard University that is called Alarm, that basically try to uh, constrain the voltage variation inside the CPUs. And here we, we, use, we have tried to use uh, it digit to adapt the code at runtime. And also, yeah, we have evaluated it digit to uh, specialize specialize the code at runtime based on runtime values. <coughs> so just one word on this project. The author of this project is Vijay Janaparedi. And basically what we, what we have done is uh, this work is a plugin of Ildigit. So basically um, uh, profile the, uh, the generated code and it adapt the code in order to constrain, to smooth the voltage variation of the CPU. <coughs> OK. 
the work in progress of the framework is that we are currently working to support generics and what is called platform invoke, pinvoke. We, we are making the interprocedural analysis and optimization on top of Illdigit. And we are uh, implementing what, mm, what is missing on loop-based optimizations, like loop normalization, loop fusion. And currently, I'm working on this topic. So we, uh, we detect and exploit coarse grain program parallelism <coughs> of the CIR programs. OK. Now I'm going to jump to, to, I think, what is more interesting part of the talk is what we have called dynamic locate compilation. Basically, uh, the idea is the following. <coughs> if we have this statical graph, uh, m0, that column 1, that column 2, column 3, and column 4, then in the JIT compilation, we have if you run this program in Illdigit, so by using this pipeline, we have that first the method M0 has been compiled to in the intermediate representation, then it has been optimized, translated, initialized the memory, and then finally we execute the method M0. So as, as we can see, there is only one thread that is active for every, for every time. Right? Then when the execution goes through the trampolines, then the M1 is put in on top of the, the pipeline and the process repeat. Okay. Inside the DLA, com DLA compilation, we, have, we want to achieve this, this behavior. We start translating M0. We move M0 to the second stage, and we push M1 to the first stage, etc. Is a, is a pipeline model. It's really, it's really simple. OK. Now, this program is really easy. So basically, to compute the order of meter to push in, in the pipeline, is, it's really easy to compute the, the, the optimal order. <coughs> but we, if we have this statical graph, when we compile M0, we have to decide if we want to compile M1 first or M4. Right, <coughs> and if we if we have this statical graph, then it's much more complicated, right? <coughs> okay. So basically, um, the idea behind the DLA compiler is that we want to compile the bytecode before the execution asks for it, which is the different from just-in-time compilation, right? Which compile only when we are sure that that piece of code is really needed to, 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 to compile. <coughs> the observation is that the, uh, nowadays the problem, predominant technology is multi many cores. So the idea is to exploit this kind of parallelism provided by the hardware in order to compile in parallel different methods. OK. And what we, we're going to see soon is that DLA basically is a bridge between just-in-time and out-of-time compilation. <coughs> OK. So the target is, uh, in order to achieve the same performance as the static compilation, we need to decrease the executions. We need to delete the execution <coughs> stores and generate optimal code before starting its first execution. Okay, so the, uh, so the approach is that the LA compiler looks ahead within the code graph at runtime. So the code graph has been also computed at runtime. And we compile ahead of time the methods that we think uh, we're going to execute soon. Consider that there is no knowledge a priori <coughs> of the program. So everything has to be computed uh, at runtime. The runtime behavior that we have on this type of compiler is that uh, first, <coughs> we need to follow the executing method. So if we, uh, the red box shows the method that is, is in execution. So when we, execute, when we are executing this method, 
we detect the set of methods that we want to compile ahead of time, and we call this region look at the region. So we detect this set of methods, we compute the order to push this method on the pipe, and then we start to compiling them. If the execution of the method change, if the method uh, executing method change from this point to this point, also the look at the look at region has to follow the executing method, right? In this way, we basically what we want to do is is generate the code before the execution asks for it, <coughs> right? The second behavior is that even if the, execu the executing method doesn't change, what, we, uh, what can change is the uh, available resources. So for example, some, uh, idle, some CPU becomes idle, so we have more resources, or, or a user run another program, so we have few uh, CPUs to use it. Right? So we need to, we need to change the look at region accordingly. <coughs> in order to, we need to shrink or enlarge the look at region in order to avoid the uh, thread switching cost, right? Okay. <coughs> yep. How many, how many outages are there really in, in home? Oh, uh, how many, uh, the size of the, of the, oh, it, it's huge. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, after we, we detect the look at region, we have to compute the, or the, the order of the methods to push from the pipe. <coughs> so basically, every time we, we are executing the method M, we want to compile the methods that are reachable from M and that we think that uh, the execution is going to call this set of methods. So we have uh, the statical graph, which, is, which we don't know before the execution. We have, and we have the dynamic known statical graph, which is the subset of the statical graph no, computed at runtime. Right. So basically, we, the DLA compiler rely on this graph and, uh, to, in order to compute the methods order. What we, uh, what a DLA compiler does is uh, compute the look at region and compute the likely, likelihood of invocation of a method and the estimation time, the estimation distance between the, the uh, first ex ex execution of the source method and the, uh, the execution of the first instruction of the destination method. With these two values, we compute a weight and we put on the dynamically known statical graph. And then we, the, we compute the order accordingly to, the, to, to these weights. So be, and consider that here we have a threshold that uh, basically defines the look at region. And the threshold depends on available resources. We have, we have said that DLA is a bridge between just in time and ahead of time because if you consider, if we, if we uh, set this threshold as zero, this is a just in time compiler. If we set the threshold to infinite, it's a ahead of time compiler if the compilation has been performed statically. Right? <coughs> so in some sense, it's a generalization of the just in time approach and ahead of time approach. What we found is that it's really important to have this kind of internal compiler structure. So basically, we have uh, ovals are threads. And uh, here, BC is bytecode. And we need two different priority queues. The first one here is high level priority queue. This one is low level priority queue. This is really important because every time we have a misprediction, so the execution goes outside the look at region because we have uh, computed wrongly the, the, the branch prediction, for example, can happen. 
what we want to do is minimize the execution stall in, that, in this case. So if the execution asks for a method that is not yet compiled, this method has been put on the high level priority queue, which has been per forward till the end, <coughs> right? If the method already exists in the, in the pipe, it, it can be moved from, the, from low level priority queue to high level priority queue. Otherwise, <coughs> when we translate the bytecode to the intermediate representation, we, in, at this stage, we compute the dynamically known statical graph, and we push the, uh, the method that we think uh, we're going to need soon in the low level priority queue. Right? <coughs> Consider that the number of threads at each stage has been uh, computed as the, uh, with the model that we have already seen, the hysteresis model. What we have found is that quite most always uh, we, we have few threads at, at this stage, like two or three, three threads, and more threads here and just one thread here. This is because <coughs> at, um, this is not a bottleneck. So basically, uh, the, the time spent here is really negligible. The time spent here also is, is negligible. And most of the time we spend on optimizing the code. Is it, it, it is expected. <coughs> so as a result, if we compare just-in-time compilation to DLA compilation, and here we have <coughs> execution time, right? So we start translating M1, we jump to execute M1, then we, the execution goes through the trampoline, so the execution is go back to, is redirected back to the compiler, which translate M2, and then finally run the, <coughs> the method M2. If you look at the DLA compiler, basically each row is a, is a um, CPU, and we perform in parallel translation and optimization, and then we, we, we hope to, to execute the, the code without going to, through the trampolines. <coughs> in order to evaluate the importance of computing the right order of methods, we have implemented two different DLA compilers. The first one, compute the likelihood of invocation. Uh, it doesn't compute the likelihood of invocation, so basically every method has the same probability to be executed soon. The second one compute the estimation time distance based on the parsing order. <coughs> the second implementation is more refined. We, um, we rely on, the, on, the pap on this paper, on this, on this work, branch prediction for free from BAL, this is a good trade-off between the time spent to compute the branch prediction and the accuracy that we really need. And the estimation time distance is computed really easy. So basically, if the, the, the cone instruction has been predo is predominated by a loop, then the time distance is high, otherwise it's low. So this is a uh, more tuned implementation. If you compare these two DLA compilers, uh, here we have the execution time <coughs> normalized by the just in time, by the just in time, uh, by normalized with respect to the execution time of, of the JIT, of the just in time. So here we have the execution time of the JIT. The first bar is DLA1, and the second one is DLA2, the more, more tuned DLA compiler. So uh, even in this case, lower is better. So if we can, and the, the platform is a four cores, four, yeah, no, yeah, four cores. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry, four cores, uh, Xeon. Okay, sorry, at two, two, 2 2.4 gigahertz. <coughs> and uh, even, even if we have a four cores, in the first implementation, the execution time is really close to the just-in-time compiler because basically the order is always wrong, basically. And so always we have a misprediction, which is the, in, in the case of misprediction, the DLA behavior is like the just-in-time behavior. But we spend, we use more memory and also. <coughs> but in the second case, basically we always outperform the first 
the, the just-in-time compiler, as well as the first implementation of DLA, <coughs> right? So this result gives you the idea that it's really important to implement, to, to uh, compute the right order of the methods. Yeah? Uh, how many threads do these programs use usually? Uh, how many threads of, of uh, in this case, uh, uh, how many compiler threads? No, user threads. User thread is one. And if we compare the ahead of time, just in time, and DLA compilation, here we're going to use DLA2, which is the more tuned one. So we can see that uh, and the gray bar is DLA that run on two cores. The black one is DLA that run on four cores. And the blue one is the ahead of time compilation. So basically, the execution time is normalized again with the execution time of the just-in-time compiler. So even in this case, lower is better. As we can see, is basically we, we, the execution time is really close to the static compilation, but most always. See? If we make a breakdown of the execution time of the DLA compiler, we see that the gray area is the time span to run the, the generated code. <coughs> so basically, we see that always we overlap the, both the translation, the CIL to IR and the, the IR to the machine code. And we, uh, we have just a, uh, we spend only f really few time to optimize the code in this case. Otherwise, it's basically quite most always we, we spend time only on uh, running the generated code. That's why the execution time is really close to the head of time compiler. Those are properties of the benchmarks. Sorry? Those are properties of the benchmarks, which means that run a lot of time. Yes. Spend a lot of time executing. In this case, the, the execution time is not really long. Otherwise, we, the, the execution, sorry, the, the, the execution time is in, in the, the compilation effort that are behind this program are uh, like four, from 40 to 60 percent. Yeah. Yeah, and it depends also on the optimization settings. Sorry, it's, it's more complicated than this. Basically, uh, it depends on which optimization settings you want to apply. In the DLA compiler, we apply more optimized. We 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 exploit more. Uh, a, a superset of code optimization algorithm compared to the just in time. So it's 40, from 40 to 60 percent is the time spent by the, by the DLA compiler to run the optimization. And the just in time is less than 10 percent because it doesn't rely on the full set of optimization settings. That's because you're compiling using four cores, right? You're only executing on a single core. Yes. So you're overlapping the compile time. Yes. So basically, the DLA compiler is, is, is able to, to apply more aggressive optimizations because it can, it is a, it can uh, overlap the, the optimizations. <coughs> the drawbacks is that we use more memory, <coughs> of course, because every time we have a misprediction, uh, sorry, uh, so since we, we compile the bytecode before we are sure that we're going to execute it, we really need to it. We, we really need these methods, then uh, there is a probability to compile more methods than what the just-in-time compiler does. And in, in, the benchmark, in the benchmark that we have seen, we compile 10% ten, ten more methods compared to the just-in-time. Also, we use 13% more memory because first we compile more, method, more methods and also because we need to store the dynamically known statical graph and also the branch prediction information. So it used 13% more memory. Uh, th this is related to the memory used by the compiler, not, not the memory used by the CIL program. Yeah? So I would expect, like, on some of these benchmarks, like, once you compile, like, 100 methods that you're ever going to need, now it's going to run the benchmark on the convention the benchmark. But since you've got these four, four cores and three extra cores, 
and this queue list of work items, you're going to start generating, you're going to keep compiling methods speculatively and, and pretty soon you'll compile the entire closure of every possible method that could be reached. And before you, I mean, you're going to keep compiling methods even though you're not going to need any methods. See? You 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 can do that, but uh, the DLA compiler doesn't do that. But why does it not do that? Why does it not say, well, if I throw an exception, I'm going to compile this method, and then I'm going to compile these five more methods, and then these five more methods, all when I throw the exception, I would take that down. The, the problem of this approach is that if you, uh, I've tried to implement this approach, but it doesn't no, work. No, not to compile methods is what you want. So sorry, sorry. How would it know not to compile these methods? Oh, it's, it's, it's based on, on, sorry, on the definition of lookalike region. So basically, the 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 uh, the probability, for example, the probability to computer to uh, to execute M4, it is related to the probability of executing of executing M3. So basically, if, if the executing method is here, and then uh, the, we, we compute the, the execution probability. Uh, uh, I understand. Let's say there's like a, a particular control flow region. It says if go one way, else go the other way. And it, when you actually run your benchmark, it's always going to go one of those control flow ways, but not never go the other way. Right. But how do you know ahead of time that you're never going to need to compile any of the methods? Associated with that other control program. Oh. So you basically no, doing it's going to, if I want a long running benchmark, it's going to start compiling more and more methods and no, finding more things. No, because it stays close. It's that region. That region oh, stays tight. The, hot, the, yeah. the currently executing method. Yeah. And the region is, is basically it is uh, it is, uh, it is computed based on the knowledge of what the method is executing. Yeah, from the currently Okay. Yeah. So you, you basically, the way I understood it is you're doing some static branch prediction. And you're, yes. You're annotating the graph with some probabilities, and you have some threshold, and you say, if it's within this threshold, I will go ahead and compile it. And then you have some some amount of look ahead. Yeah. And I, I'm assuming that you increase the amount of look ahead if you're getting better and better results. Yes. Yeah. And, and also if you have more resources. Also, you can. Uh, it depends also, you can tune this, this behavior, for, for example, for embedded system. If you want to not spend more than X amount of memory, then you can say, okay, the look at the region cannot increase too much. Or you, you. So do you, um, let's say you're, you're look ahead region, you're getting like 100% uh, prediction accuracy, and so your region is getting bigger. I'm assuming you go deeper if you're doing well. Uh, if you're doing well, and um, and uh, if you do, uh, it, it uh, you have to consider also the available resources. So even if you're doing well, but there is there isn't idle CPUs, then you don't increase the lookalike region. Okay. But if there is an idle CPU and you're doing 100 percent accuracy on the prediction, you will increase the look ahead. Yes. And you'll pull it back, I presume. Yes. You start losing resources or your threshold. Start your probability sort of game works. Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, so within a region, you're looking at basically the probability for that you know uh, method to be called, right? Within a single region. Yes. Now, we have cases where maybe your region being instead of being like a circle like that would be a weird shape because you may have something which has a higher probability outside of this region that you want to basically in your GP for oh, or your combine before. Definitely, the real situation is, is this one. That you, you, you. So you're not only looking at, so you're not basically removing it, everything out of this region. You're basically comparing. Can you actually go back to the, the formula you have, please? Yes. <coughs> so uh, uh, you're thinking about the shape of the region. No? Yeah, I'm trying to see how you combine the probability of execution with mm -hmm. the distance from the current oh, execution. Uh, there is a. Uh, uh, okay. Here. There is a, a function that that you, uh, a monotonic function, basically that uh, combine these two parameters. Currently, is uh, here there is two different implementation threshold that you have to tune. It depends on also on the uh, it depends on also on the underlying platform. It depends on uh, 
But basically, the, the idea is that if you, okay, if the method is, if, if you uh, don't know if the method is going to be executed soon, you don't compile in ahead of time. Or if you know that the estimation, if you know that that method is going to be executed far away from now, you don't start executing it. Yes, it's really a combination of those two. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, so. How sensitive are your performance results to this tuning? I mean, it sounds like you put a lot of thought into it. Uh, currently, no. Um, <clears throat> it's not really sensible if you, uh, uh, sorry, it depends also on the platform. But if you, uh, if you have a, a threshold where that is, really, is, uh, is designed with respect to the branch prediction computed to compute these values, then it's not sensible on the underlying platform. Because it depends on, on the, uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> it depends on the uh, weight that you compute from the branch prediction. I mean, have you tried running your benchmarks with different tuning? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. And I, Do you see a lot of variation? No, no. I didn't try to to. I didn't try to apply this technique in a different platform where the communication is has different latency. I didn't try that, so I don't know. I have al always used this kind of platform that the uh, it has a. a mm, uh, L2 cache it, that is shared across the CPUs. But for example, if you increase the latency, then maybe something can differ. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is the, uh, the translation and optimization done exclusively in procedurally at this point? Uh, sorry, sorry. Is, it, when you translate and optimize, do you do it intra procedurally at this point? Or do you have inter procedural analysis? I have interprocedural analysis. Interprocedural? Interprocedural, yeah. OK. Um, so for, for these regions, when you look at one of these regions, you have several uh, methods connected. Um, some of them may not necessarily be reachable at runtime. So when you optimize the code, um, isn't, it, isn't it the case that uh, several constraints introduced by some of those unreachable pieces of code may make their way into the, uh, into the optimization? Uh, Okay, you think it to to tune the optimization algorithm by exploiting this information? No. I'm, I'm just wondering how the um, how the in, inter procedural optimization algorithm goes in the presence of of these uh, possibly unreachable pieces of code. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, currently, I didn't. Uh, optimize the code in an interprocedural fashion. I run the branch prediction in an interprocedural way, but the optimization is intraprocedural. So, I, yeah, it, it is a possibility. Yeah, but I, I didn't try. No. <coughs> okay. There are other questions. Quick yeah. question. Some questions about your IR. Um, yeah. So, so you said you have an infinite number of registers to yeah. do a, a three instruction type? Uh, no. Is that, I assume, or? Um, uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, three address, sorry, instruction three address. And, and do you do write once? So when you register, this gets written to once? Or do you? Uh, no, it's, a, it's a, uh, basically uh, uh, there isn't an accumulator. This, this is the question. To, if, if I'm relying on uh, some accumulator register or something like that. No. Well, it, was, it, was, it was more um, what the structure of your IR is so that, and, and how you see that as facilitating the optimization process. Well, this is because, uh, basically this is because the, the semantics of each, uh, of each instruction is really simple mm -hmm. and really... Uh, uh, do you do, do you, is there any penalty for using lots and lots of registers in your IR? Or, or um, uh, are they essentially free and, and further down when you actually generate the machine code? Currently, you, yeah. you assign addresses more efficiently. Yeah, uh, currently, we, we, we want to uh, the number we want that 
uh, this unlimited number of registers because we don't want to have aliases across variables. And, and then uh, we rely on the register allocation to, to map right. so, so for each logical value, you, yes. you allocate a new register? And yes. Okay. yes. Uh, but it's not SSA based. Okay. So, so you don't just do the right ones? Yeah. So uh, currently, there is a, this is an open question of, on this project, if we want to change to SSA form, mm -hmm. for example. So, so one question then, I mean, it's a machine-independent yeah. IR. What, what would prevent somebody from um, you know, having that be their bytecode that gets distributed? Is it, is it a lot bigger than, yes. than the CIL? It is bigger, okay. yes. So the CIL is... The order of magnitude is like five or ten times larger? Or? Oh, uh, I don't know. I should check. But, but it's bigger, yes. So the CIL is really good because it's really compacted. Okay. And the ahead of time um, compilation, yeah. how far ahead of time is that basically uh, done at this, you know, that before you would ship the assembly out to the target machine that it's going to run? Or, or when is... Uh, the, the ahead of time? Yes. So uh, currently, the out of time store uh, translate and optimize the code and store and file the IR representation, mm -hmm. and then at runtime it loads the IR. But if, if you're going to put this in a commercial production, if you still wanted the compactness of CIL for distribution, <coughs> oh, I see. Then you'd have to do the ahead of time when you install on the machine or something, kind of end gen time. Right. Right. Is, is that am I reading accurately? What? Uh, okay. I see what it. Uh, hmm. Well, currently the ahead of time, um, I, I don't think the intermediate representation is is good language to to distribute the the, the compiled matrix because it's, it's big and uh, their and also their organization is not uh, compacted in classes, for example, or are not organized in mod module of the CIM, mm -hmm. for example. So, so that means really when you install on the target machine, it's going to be ahead of time? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, currently, we are, we, we are working also to make the uh, full out of time. So we want, we want to write, for example, the ELF or PACOP binary. But it is not ready. Yeah, but the, the idea is to, to make the out of time at installation time. And also the in, uh, the uh, <coughs> the um, uh, encoding of IR into the file system, it is designed in order to minimize the decoding deserialization phase. So it is bigger than the usual in order to have better performance at runtime. <coughs> so when you're when you're. Uh Shipping this around between cores, aren't you paying some penalty for communication because your representation is larger? Um, uh, no, because the intermediate representation, it, when, when, when it is uh, deserialized in memory and then it is inside memory, then it's not, it is, uh, uh, it's not really big. Yes. Another question about your IR. Um, so, I didn't catch it from your earlier slides, but presumably the, uh, the IR must also have a notion of, of a stack, and you, you must have some, some type of stack instructions. Uh, no, why? Why? No. Um, okay, I, I'm just curious how how then do you um, how do you deal with uh, like recursive? Calls? Oh, sorry. Like, you're talking about the allocation frame that okay. is allocated. Yes, 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 yes. That's yes, yes. One way to yes. 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 Also because the CIL bytecode, the CLI architecture, uh, it forced you to allocate, uh, so sometimes it forced you to allocate the object or value type to the stack. So you have to have the stack inside any kind of your language. Okay, so, so basically your IR then is a, is a, is a hybrid type of, uh, an x86-like instruction set that has both notions, registers, and yes stack-based operations. Um, so in that case, are, are you, is, is the fact that you're using registers simply to, to facilitate various 
analyses, like liveness analyses and things like that, that, that will allow you to work with these uh, you know, objects, entities symbolically in yes. terms of registers, as opposed to looking at stack locations and, uh, and doing stack analysis? Yes, yes, because uh, basically, because we, uh, since we, since we uh, uh, I, I think that the, the optimization part of the compiler is really a big task. So what I want to do is, what I want to do is, is minimize the, the effort that you have to spend if you want to implement your optimization algorithm. In that case, the IR is really good for, to implement this kind of stuff. So for example, the liveness analysis, uh, I think is less than 100, less than 100 line of code to implement the liveness analysis. Okay, and uh, uh, another drawback is that we 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 uh, use more power, of course, because we basically we burst C idle CPUs, and maybe sometimes this sometimes you, you, you cannot do that. Depends on your on your scenario, <coughs> and also the implementation of the compiler is much more complicated with respect to the just-in-time compilers. It takes me months. To, to implement this kind of stuff. <coughs> so now, if, if uh, I just put two slides on how to use or extend Ildigit. If you want to use Ildigit, if you want to use out of time compiler, you run Ildigit minus minus AOT in the name of CIR program. If you want to use DLA compiler, Ildigit minus, minus minus DLA. If you want to use the just in time compiler, Ildigit. Because basically it is a compilation framework, so everything has been shared across static compiler, compiler dynamic compiler, parallel compiler. <coughs> if you want to extend Ildigit, if you want to ex uh, add new plugin, then it's really easy. You download the dummy plugin, you implement the function, and you compile and install, and install the new plugin as a, as a separate module. Otherwise, if you want to extend uh, internal modules, which is strange because is I, I don't I don't imagine a, a scenario where you have to, but if you want to oh if if you want to 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 support another kind of bytecode then you have to extend this type of model then the the effort that you have to put is strongly depend on strongly depends on the chosen model. model. <coughs> so I'm going to give you some reference. If you, if, you, uh, if you read the software practice experience, this is a good paper that shows the, the framework, only the framework. Uh, this paper shows you the, our implementation of the uh, a, uh, ARM backend. <coughs> and the DLA idea and implementation has been presented in the CC conference. And these two papers are about uh, using Ildigit in a different scenario, that is, adapt the code at runtime, which was basically was a plugin, only, only a plugin. <coughs> From the Ildigit point of view, there was no difference between this kind of optimization and uh, liveness analysis. And some website, this is Ildigit uh, website, the Alarm Research Project website, the, the group where I came from, Polytechnic in Milano, the Harvard website, my website. <coughs> and I'm going to present really uh, the, 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 the team. The, basically, the project, uh, maybe it doesn't look like, but it's a really big project. So I couldn't do alone, of course. So basically, I have managed uh, several students for, in master thesis in order to implement different models. And Michele Tartara has made the ARM, ARM backend, Etrospaziale implemented delegates, which is basically the function pointer of the CLI standard. Implement also the mono based class library and one garbage collector. <coughs> also, Crespi Regizzi was my advisor on, on this project. Luca Rocchini implemented, is implementing generics, and Andrea Di Biagio uh, uh, impl implemented the exception system and the CIL layout. And Martino Sicura designed the logo. <laughs> and also 
a lot of students of the university. <coughs> so as acknowledgement, I want to say thank you to the whole ELTG team, the pr two professor and Vijay Janaparedi for to help me to extend ELTG on the Alarm Research Project and others me that invite me on this talk and you that you, you pay attention on this talk also. So, <coughs> so I spent five years on this project. And then I'm sure I'm going to spend more years. So if you have any suggestion or future work or whatever you think is important, please let me know. I will really appreciate that. Okay. So thank you. If you uh,